get your Bibles and let's go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. Thank you so much for that good singing. I enjoy hearing you sing and it's such a gift to our church that we have a singing church. Amen? Amen. And uh, everybody ought to be singing and lifting up their voice in praise and worship to the Lord. And we thank God for the beautiful music tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. Thank you, fellas, for your instrumentalists, the singers, uh, the working on the platform. And I just need your attention for 35 minutes now as I'm going to preach a fifth in a series of messages around the subject of separation. And I hope that you give me a hearing, give me uh, just a, a little bit more attention to this subject. I'm, I'm following the, the mind of the Spirit on this subject and, uh, and so tonight, with the Lord's help, we'll continue this look at this doctrine, this vital doctrine of separation. The Bible says in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As, I've, uh, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Isn't that a great verse? God makes these personal pronoun connections to us. My people, I will be their God. Verse 17, wherefore, in other words, understanding, I'm with you, and you're with me, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Verse 1, chapter 7, Having therefore these precious promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let's make our prayer. Father, I pray in Jesus' name now you add your blessing to the reading of your word. Open our hearts and minds, even as that song that we just uh, heard sung and participated in, Search Me, O God. May you put the spotlight on us individually. It's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it's me, O Lord, standing in need of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. In our series of messages that we've brought to you these several weeks on this doctrine, uh, we started off looking at the behavior of separation. I'll not reiterate that, but let me just tell you, on the top of my mind, let us be reminded that no one in this church or no one in Christianity is better than anyone else. There's no difference. In my prayer tonight, I actually said that at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. Aren't you glad for that? I don't care what kind of background you have. I say I don't care. I mean, it's irrelevant what kind of background you come from, whatever is your, uh, we'll say, human handicap. It's all even when it comes to grace. So the behavior of separation is we don't look down on people just because you dress a certain way maybe or refuse to go to certain places or, or prohibit yourself from behavior. Uh, otherwise, that does not suggest that we're better than anybody else. So we visited that for a good while in that lesson. So behavior of separation. Then we look secondly at the beginning of separation. We did a biblical study on separation in scripture. You remember we, we went into heaven and we looked at Lucifer and the angels when they sinned. God separated Lucifer from heaven. God kicked him out of heaven. It's interesting to be reminded God did not have a meeting of the minds. When Lucifer uh, uh, led that insurrection against, Jesus, against God, God didn't call him up and say, look, let's find what we agree on because what we agree on is a whole lot more than what we disagree on. God didn't do that. God separated him. There was no discussion there. It was an act, a judicial act from God. God separated himself from Lucifer. Then we talked about creation. Don't you love this world that we have? Aren't you glad that a cow, a black cow, can eat green grass, give white milk and yellow butter and red meat? Can I hear an amen? 
God separated creation, light from darkness, dry land from water. God separated the species from the species. And so we see separation in creation. We saw it in the days of the week, uh, the six days of creation, the sun, moon, and the stars. God, God separated his creation. Then we saw, thirdly, that God dealt with Adam and Eve pretty severely. How many will agree with that? Right. Considering the little thing that they did, right? All they did was question God. But God said, nope, sorry, got to separate you. And so Adam and Eve, because they questioned God's authority and challenged God's authority, the result of that was that they were disobedient. Eve took of the fruit, gave her to her husband, and they became sinners. So because of that, you remember what happened? Genesis chapter 3, God separated them from the garden. He put a cherubim there with a flaming sword, disallowed re-entrance into the Garden of Eden. And so we see separation in, in, in heavens. We see it in creation. We see it in the garden. We see, number four, separation concerning Israel as a nation. God separated Israel from all other nations of the earth. We visited that extensively in that study. I won't go back to that. And then number four, we talked about God, uh, number five, God separating the church, that is the Christian, from the world. And so we looked at those things, but tonight uh, we're, we're not talking about the behavior or the beginning of separation. A third thing we talked about several weeks ago now was the beings of separation, the beings of separation. We identified three in particular that the Bible says that we're to separate from. If a brother walks disorderly, the Bible says separate from them. If someone refuses the authority of the Word of God, separate from them. We won't revisit that tonight because I want to move on and continue and hopefully finish this uh, uh, fourth main topic under the subject of separation, and that is dealing with the basis of God's separation. So we have the behavior, the beginning, the beings, and number four, the basis of separation. Now let me just remind you, we talked about, first of all, God commands his children to be separated to put clear distinction between God's program and the devil's program. Listen, let me ask you a question. How many think here the devil has an actual program for mankind? There's no doubt about it. He's got an agenda for every young person. He's got an agenda for every single person. He's got an agenda for every married couple. And listen to me, whatever God's program is, Satan's got the opposite. Mark that down. Satan creates nothing. Satan doesn't create a thing. What he does, he perverts what God did create. Uh, intimacy between a man and woman is sanctified in a marital union, but Satan perverts that. He doesn't create anything. He doesn't uh, uh, start anything. He's the great pre uh, pre he, pretender and the perverter. And so Satan perverts music. God created music. And how many will agree with me that the devil uses music to pervert the minds of young people? and people in general. Satan is a great perverter, and so God insists on a clear distinction between God's program and the devil's program. And we talked about it in the Old Testament, and I want to draw you back to where I left off last time. Go to the book of Ezekiel, please, and Ezekiel chapter number 22. So get your Bibles uh, limbered up, and we're going to do a little bit of Bible research tonight. And I want to see in verse... 26 of chapter number 22. Now, Ezekiel is one of the great major prophets. We call them the major prophets. And I love the, the, uh, the graphic Brother Dotson put up there. You've got a donkey and, a, and what is that other thing there? I don't know what that is. Uh, but uh, the Bible says that God doesn't want an oxen and an ass to pull together. The word ass there, of course, refers to a donkey. And so God doesn't want those pulled together. If you could change that to a donkey and an ass, that would be great. Uh, a mule, an oxen. Uh, but notice what it says in verse number 26. Verse number 26. Now God is speaking here through the prophet. And notice, uh, let's, let's look at verse number 23. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. Notice the conspiracy in verse 18. Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. Oh, they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace. They are even dross of silver. You know what dross is? It's the waste. It's the slag. If you've ever done any kind of welding, there's a slag that comes over the bead that you run. If you do arc welding, dross is that, that, that scum that comes up. And because the, the priests and the prophets refuse to be separated, God says they become dross. 
They're no longer the pure lead or the pure silver, but dross. Let me finish the reading in verse 26. He says, they have, middle verse, they have put no difference between the holy and profane. Are you seeing this? Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. And have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. I want you to just see the, the reiteration of the words, no difference. They put no difference. He says, because they put no difference, I am polluted among them. Now, God is not polluted. You can't pollute God. But in their relationship with God, it's become polluted. So God says this, this, this blending, this blurring of the line, God said is polluting our relationship is God, and God is intent on this difference matter. The principle is this, God re requires an identified or identifiable distinction among his people. God insists on that. It, it, it draws a line in between how a Christian should be, and how an unchristian should be, or how a priest should be. When we talk about priests, we're not talking about a Roman Catholic priest. We're talking about a Levitical priest. Someone who exercised the covenant worship and the, the sanctuary worship of the tabernacle and temple. So God says, I want a distinction. Look at chapter 44, Ezekiel, please. Chapter 44, and just kind of just a couple of pages over there. And uh, uh, I see a couple of you fanning. Is it, is it warm in here? Oh, it is a little warm. I'm sorry. We're trying to, uh, somebody call the governor and tell him to turn the air down in the state. Amen. Drop the humidity a little bit, governor. Uh, chapter 44, verse number 20. We're running the system as hard as we can. Look at verse number 20. And here again, this is a continuation of God's complaint through the prophet in chapter uh, 20, uh, 22 earlier. Notice chapter 40 and look at verse 20. Neither shall they shave their heads nor suffer their locks to grow long. Uh, they shall only pull their heads. Uh, uh, why did I read that verse? I don't know what that's about. Uh, that's not what I wanted. Uh, but look at verse 23. I'll, I'll give you that one. How's that? Look at verse 23. Uh, it says, they shall teach my people the difference between what? The holy and profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. Here's what God is saying to the priests. You failed. You've polluted my, my, my worship. You've become dross. Why? Because two things here. They failed to teach and they failed to cause the people to put a distinction. Go to Hosea now. Go turn right. Go to Hosea, uh, Amos, uh, Obadiah, Jonah, Hosea, Joel, Hosea, chapter uh, number four, if you would please. Hosea, that's, that's a minor prophet. Just turn right. Go a few pages. Don't just close your Bible, church. Learn to find these books in your Bible, and it, you, will, you, will, you will be a Bible student to find those. Don't ever get frustrated with that. And uh, you, we no, no problem. If you don't find it, uh, nobody's going to point you out. Look at chapter 4, verse number 6. Boy, this is a powerful verse. You, wanna, you might want to mark it in your Bible. Here, here's what the prophet Hosea says. Verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. God is putting emphasis here on this thing of knowledge. Knowledge of what? Who you are and who you belong to. Look at that picture. Thank you, Brother Dodson. That's a perfect fix. I like that. You see an oxen and an ass on the other side. By the way, it's a Bible word. I'm not cursing. Amen. It's a donkey. And so God puts a distinction. And I'm trying to tell you, listen to me. I'm trying to tell you, your life, my life, must never be a hybrid or a conglomerate of this world in Christianity. This worldly and spiritual mix, this conglomerate, this, this, uh, this hybrid mentality that I could be a Christian and I could be just like the world. Or I could be a Christian and I could have a Christian life and an unchristian life. No, you can't. If your desire is to please the Lord, you can't play both sides. 
You try that in your marriage. I'll be a married man, but I'll also be a single man. Doesn't work. Amen? I know I don't agree with everything in this country, but I am 100% American. I love my country, and I'm not going to defy that. I'm going to be true to what I am. Listen, I, I am a C-H-R-A-S-T-I-A-N at Walmart. I'm a Christian at Sunoco. I'm a Christian on the street corner. I'm a Christian in my neighborhood. I'm a Christian when I'm out running and exercising. I am a Christian, and it's time God's people get back to having clear distinctions. That we're Christians all the time. And so we're, we're not to bend or budge. In our identity. Look at me, listen to me. This church, this church is not going to seek a more modern music style Amen. to grow this church. Amen. We're not doing it. You know why? Because I and you believe in separation. Amen. We can't bring Hollywood into this church. Right. How many will agree Hollywood certainly is not a spiritual thing? I mean, it is what it is. I, uh, you might like Cary Grant. You might like John Dillon. Uh, John Dillinger. I don't think you like him, uh, or, or whatever you might you might appeal to some movies or whatever. But I am telling you, this place is not a place where we're going to mix in the world to reach the world. We're not going to do it. We've got to separate, set a line. So separation draws a line. You remember the story about Jim Bowie at the Alamo, Sam Houston. Those guys were there, I think 168 men. They're there, Santa Ana's army, 10,000 uh, Mexican troops are out there. For three days, they besieged them, and, and, and Jim Bowie knew it. He, he was, he was uh, in a bed sick with pneumonia. He couldn't move. So Sam Houston said, uh, whoever wants to uh, die with me in the Alamo, he drew a line. He said, everybody with me, come across the line. Bowie was laying there on a cot. He said this, don't you leave me on that side of the line. Pick me up and carry me over. And he did. Only one man escaped that to tell the story later. And I'm just telling you something. It's time. I said, it's time. It's time. God's people, draw a line. Stand fast for God. There has to be a line. There has to be a line. Oh, pastor, I'm so tired. Everybody's tired. I'm so tired of fighting, pastor. I'm tired of, listen to me, I've been pastor 30, 38 years. I'm not bending the line. I'm not blurring the line. I'm redrawing the line deeper in the sand. Amen. So, so uh, distinction, the word distinction by definition means a difference or a contrast. Amen. A contrast. You, now, you can appreciate this basis I'm talking about, especially as you place it within the Levitical guidelines given in the Word of God. Now, I won't go back and teach all that, but you remember this. When Israel left Egypt, they were slaves. They were slaves. The Jews had been for six generations slaves. Listen, keep listening. Would you think in those six generations Maybe if this was where they were when Jacob went into Egypt as Jews, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, spiritually, their behavior was up here. How many would think after 400 years, maybe this changed to this? And so here they are coming out of Egypt. The line had been blurred so much that there was very little identifiable qualities of Jews. They were here when they went in, here when they went out, six generations. And so God had to bang into them this deep line. And he said, I want you to have these distinctions. And so when Moses led them out of Egypt, they got to that mount where God's presence was, where the Shekinah glory, the mountain quaked and moved with the voice of God. And Moses got the Ten Commandments. And for the first time on earth, God established a righteous rule of behavior for mankind relating to God called the Decalogue. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul. Or there be no other gods before me, have no images he said, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Then he did the, the, the number five, I know the father and the mother. And he gave laws, guidance. All of that was to identify his people. To identify, to draw a line. Because the pagans of Egypt, they had no regard for the things of God. That doesn't mean they, had, they didn't have religion. Listen to me, religion is man-made. Religion is human ways of trying to get to God. And this is why we have Confucianism and Hinduism and Zen Buddhism 
and Catholicism and Protestantism uh, and, and uh, all the other isms. They're all human efforts to get to God. You say, well, you mentioned Protestantism. Uh, isn't that what we are? No, we're not. We're Biblicists. We believe the Bible. We're not part of a group of people. We take this book as the only guideline to God. And so thank God for that. So God had to draw a line. He had to make a clear distinction. Now, listen, they're at the Mount Sinai, and now they've got to go into Canaan. Guess what's in Canaan? A whole bunch of nations that were completely pagan, just like Egypt. You say, wait a minute now. So they came out of Egypt, and God gave them distinction and guidelines. They go into Canaan. Yeah, and God said this, I want you to destroy all of those nations. Because I don't want you living with them. So God said, remove them. And I know that's hard to swallow. That's hard to take. Uh, but the truth is, God required that. Why? Because, hear me, because the potential to be influenced by the pagan nations is severe. How many will agree with that? Say amen. Listen to me. You, uh, Brother Damp, I couldn't believe what you said. People are filthy. You said that tonight, right in my pulpit. And I couldn't agree more. I'm filthy. You're filthy. We've got all kinds of stuff that need to clean up. God says this, you've got your own issues. And even in the local church, we've got issues. We've got a whole bunch of sinners. Go ahead, look at your neighbor and say, you sinner. Sarah, don't ever call your mama a sinner. I saw her. We all have our issues, but even in this world, we must be careful. The Barna, uh, the Barna Group does surveys based on a 2007 study. Listen to this. Most of the lifestyle activities of born-again Christians statistically are equivalent to those of non-believers. Did you catch that? I'll read it again. Most of the lifestyle activities of born-again believers statistically are equivalent to those of unbelievers. That's a terrifying thought. That statistically, the behavior of Christians is little to no difference between the unsaved. Let that sink in. Take a, take a survey of your 30-day activities. Just, you do it yourself. Just, just write down what you do in 30 days and where you go and what you participate on uh, participate in. You'd be shocked at how little difference between you and the world. This is where we are, church. Now, you're, maybe right now you're saying, bless God, Pastor, that's not the case with me. That's because you've been working on this thing of separation. If you don't work on it, you'll blend in. We like to blend in. We do. And it's a part of proxy. We, by proxy, we fit in. We become part of the fabric. And if we're not careful, this will happen to us. By the way, it's astounding the number of believers that, that consistently visit pornographic sites, it's very little different than the world. These are statistics from Barna. Uh, you take something uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, is, is even along the line of, of consulting psychics. Many Christians are consulting psychics. And statistically, there's not a big difference there. I know it's quiet, but these are truth. Uh, uh, the, the number of Christians that consume certain levels of alcohol very similar to the unsaved crowd the use of illegal drugs or prescriptions now here's one christians that admittedly say i outright lie is very little different from the unsaved crowd we were talking in in a fellowship time before the service we have a prayer time and then we just sit around talking as men uh and uh, we were talking about uh, how how uh uh, it, it seems like uh, in this day that we're living in, uh, there, there's, just, there's just more and more of a pull on our young people. But I, I have to tell you something, young people notwithstanding, I think it's even true with older folks. That we're being pulled and we're being influenced. We don't even recognize it. What I'm saying, and I don't mean to, to spend so much time on this, but uh, what I'm saying to you is not narcissism. I'm not trying to control you for my benefit. Uh, but I will tell you this, God says this, I want you to be separated for my benefit. And guess who else benefits? We do. Yeah, right. To know who you are. I am a Christian. And God knows the very important factor of having a clear line for you. But also, let me tell you this, for the heathen, yeah. for the unsaved. We are best for this community. 
Listen to this, please. We are best for this community when we are most unlike the community. That's not common preaching today. You understand that, right? Today, it's, it's, it's let's, let's dumb it down. Let's make church more like a club. I'm not being unkind. You know this is true. Brother Brill, you understand what I'm talking about. You travel and, and you're going to church and it's just, it's just a chat time. And, you know, uh, somebody actually uh, uh, sent me a note recently. They said, at uh, California, I was preaching out there. They said, it's just good to hear old-fashioned preaching. Yeah. Now, I don't know what they mean by that. Maybe it's because I was hollering. I don't know. Uh, but, but I appreciate the fact that people want the truth and they want it straight. People are tired of this squirmy little shading. They want truth. Can I hear you say amen? They want truth. They want it straight. They want to know what is the truth. And Christians ought to have a clear line to maintain that identity as truth people in a day like this. Folks, listen to me. We must maintain a ministry and personal lifestyle that has clear lines drawn. For it is due to this our distinctiveness that enables us to minister most effectively to our culture and to our community. God's church offers what relativism and wokeism cannot. Here it is, a real and actual relationship with God that is distinct and rational. That's what we can offer as a people of God. Amen, church? So the Lord uh, des demands separation so that there's a clear distinction between God's program and the devil's program. Man, I spent 15, 16 minutes on that, and I did not mean to. But I hope you got that. There's a program out there. Listen to me, kids. Look at me. Listen to me. The devil has an agenda for your life. And the hip-hop crowd and the, the hip-hop culture and, and the, the worldly culture today that is so permeated with the flesh and the gyrations of the flesh and the allurements of the world is so palatable to young people. They need to see that there's another world you can live in. Yeah. And it's a world of holiness, a world of separation, a world of distinctiveness, a world that is pleasing to God. And wouldn't it be something if young people today and middle-aged people and older people would raise their hand and say, I want God's identity in my life. Amen. It only comes because you draw a line. You make a clear distinction. Number, number, number two, let me give you this. We're talking about the basis of separation. It's one, to show a distinction between God's program and the devil's program. Am I talking fast enough? Let me say this next. The Lord demands separation to give his people opportunity to stand for him and for right against the devil in his way. Did you catch that? God demands separation so you and I have an opportunity to stand for God in an untoward world. God calls us to a separate life from this world, not so that we can walk through life uh, floating like we're better than anybody, but so that the world can see and be understanding that there is a position that is right and we can be happy in our rightness. Say amen. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, please, if you would, and uh, uh, let's build this thought. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 11. And I've, already, I've got my, my little ribbon marker here, so I got there quick, but I'll let you get there. Ephesians, that's in the New Testament. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, page 1901 in my Bible. Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse number 11. What's the apostle say here? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, let me stop there. So I remember a young preacher, Brother McHale, was preaching years ago in a preacher boy contest in uh, Massachusetts, and he said, I want to preach to you about the willies of the devil. <laughs> the word is wiles, or the techniques, or the methods, right, church? Or the, uh, the ways that he works, and we we're, we're, we're understand that. He says that you may be able to stand against the techniques, the methods, the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Let's say that together. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Why? Why? So, so that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. What's the next word? Verse 14. Stand. Stand, therefore. And then he goes on and tells us, how we can stand in the armor of God. Three times in this passage that we just read, we're told to stand. We're told to stand against the devil. 
See, separation gives this to us against the devil and for the Lord. Now, I want you to go to First Chronicles, or Second Chronicles, please, and uh, maybe we'll, we'll be able to kind of land the plane right here. We won't finish the message, but we'll bring, uh, we'll bring the 747 in, Brother Burrell, and we'll land that thing. I'll show you how to do that later if you're interested. He's a, he's a pilot, so I'm messing with him. Second Chronicles uh, chapter number uh, 18. As you're going there, now this is a great record, a record here of uh, the great king uh, that uh, uh, was, was used of God, and yet he made a big mistake. And I'm talking about Jehoshaphat. Now Jehoshaphat was a good king, a good king in Judah. And God used him in some wonderful ways. If you took the list of good kings, Jehoshaphat would without a doubt fit within the top five of the good kings of Judah. Now, as far as we can see in Scripture, there are no good kings of Israel. Remember, Israel divided into two real kingdoms. You had Israel in the north and Judah, two tribes in the south. And of the south, the tribes in the south, now you might be saying, see, everything good is in the south. All the good kings were, were, were in the south. Okay, I'll give you that. Uh, uh, but Ahab was a king in Israel, the north, and Jehoshaphat was the king in the south. And so he's a good king, and he was a good man. Uh, he made some mistakes, though, and in chapter 18. He, he allowed wicked King Ahab to become a yoke fellow in war. Now, notice that, that graphic that Brother Dotson uh, put up there. You, you see these two animals yoked together. And I just want you to look at that for just a moment. Notice that, that broad piece of wood with the neck collar brings these two animals into servants, servant, uh, servanthood together. They're together. They, where they go, they're going together. So uh, this is why God said he didn't want an oxen and an ass to be yoked together because the oxen, both of them are burden bearers, but the oxen works a different way than the ass, the donkey. The donkey has a different spirit than the oxen. And so they would work contrary to each other, and God knew that, of course. But, but, but keep that image in your mind, because King Ahab, listen, was a wicked king. He was possibly the most wicked, and I've thought this through many times about him. I'm going to get you the text in just a moment, uh, where Ahab was married to infamous Jezebel. And, you know, Brother Dan, if I've thought this through, because it's interesting Toward the end of Ahab's life, God used him. And he had a heart that changed. And I think probably Ahab's problem was is he was a, a passive man. There's no greater threat on America tonight than passive men. Yeah. Men that just won't take a stand. Yeah. You know, Adam's problem in the garden was he was passive. Yeah, right. Think about that. I just wrote a lesson on that. I haven't taught it here, but I, I'm thinking about teaching it soon on, on the danger of passive men. Men must be assertive and not, thank you for the four amens right there. See, I need to preach that here. Uh, but, but, but I believe Je Je uh, Ahab's problem, really, I don't know if he was so inwardly wicked. It's just he was a sissy of a man. And, and he was pushed around. And he, you remember his sniveling, crying about Naboth's vineyard? You remember that? And, and, and he's crying his wife, you know, what's the matter, honey? Naboth wouldn't give me a vineyard. And she said, okay, I'll get it for you. And she had him killed and took it. And, and Ahab, Ahab, thank you, honey, sucking his thumb. God help us. Help me, church. God help us. But, but uh, I don't know why I got off on all that. But you needed to hear that. Yeah, amen, amen. God help us. By the way, you ladies, if you don't have a man in your life, be assertive. Lead those kids. Don't be, don't be passive and let your kids tell you what to do and push you around. Mama, be a mama. Amen. Come on, men, help me. If you haven't got a man to, 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 to blister hind ends once in a while to straighten those little rug apes out, amen, all of us have them too. And uh, thank God that we, we can have that influence in our homes. But, but let me get back to the story. Now, King Ahab, he comes to Jehoshaphat and he says, let's get together. Look at chapter 19. All that takes place in 18. Look at chapter 19 and uh, verse uh, uh, verse. Uh, where am I at? Second, I'm in Second Kings. Oh, help me, Lord. Second Chronicles. What chapter did I say? Okay. Does anybody know what I'm preaching right now? I'll get it. Hold on. 
chapter 19. Look at verse, verse, uh, verse 1, chapter 19. And so Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer, now the seer, notice the two E's, the seer, he's a prophet, he's a seer, he's seer, he's the seer. He, he said, look what he said to King Jehoshaphat. Remember, Jehoshaphat was a good guy. Here's what he said, shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord. Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Can you see the old prophet, the old seer? Dr. Malone used to preach this text and I can see him with his hands. Shouldest thou help the ungodly? And that's a good question for us today. Shouldest thou help the ungodly? You see, God demands separation to give his people an opportunity to stand for him and for right. And, and, and King Ahab won the day in this. By the way, if you read the rest of the story, God still won. Ahab got the co co confederation of a good king. And God was grieved at this good king who, who blurred the lines, church. He blurred the lines and he removed his opportunity to stand against evil. May God help us today continue to stand against evil so that God gets a good report. You see, listen to me. When a Christian blurs the lines, it makes God, dare I say, look bad. I want God to look good because of me. I really, 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 anytime I preach here, I pray the same thing before I come to the pulpit. Lord, help me do a good job. I don't always do a good job. I know that, but I want to do a good job. Not so that you say, oh, what a great preacher. Oh, what a man of God. Oh, no, no. I know how far that goes, the end of my nose. But I want him, I want God to feel a proud of his word. And, 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 and may, may we do a good job living today, taking a stand for God. So the Lord demands separation to give a clear distinction between the Lord's program and God's program. And here it is, I'm bringing it to you. Are you living in the Lord's program? Clearly identify. Secondly, God gives separation so that we have an opportunity to stand for God and against wrong. May God help us do that. I've got to stop there. I've got one, two, three, four more to go. And uh, I gave you an 11-point sermon this morning. Can you believe I did that? How many are still in shock over that? And I got it done in 37 minutes. Praise the Lord. And, uh, but I hope tonight you'll think about this. Church, don't be blurring. Don't be blurring. That's, that's modern right there. Do not blur the lines. Amen. Let's clearly identify we're Christians. You know what that means? We've got to stop taking the name of the Lord in vain. We've got to go to church. We've got to believe this Bible. We've got to read this Bible. Amen. See, a Christian has got to be identified. Yeah, you know, I, I see people that are happy. I like happy people. There's some of them. No Christian ought to be a grouch. Come on. Let me just remind you this, brothers and sisters. Your worst day on this earth is the worst day you'll ever have. Because we get heaven forever. Now, I know sometimes it gets hard and woe is me is the cry of a lot of people. But listen to me, what you need to do is you need to run back to that book and say, thank God he'll never leave me nor forsake thee. He loves me. He knows my name. He knows the hairs of my head, even how many used to be there. Thank God. Let's stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Thank you for listening tonight. Brother McHale's coming to sing for us and, and in the invitation. And I want the invitation here, church, to be of time for you to move. For you to make a decision, this altar is open for you tonight. I wonder tonight if you'd say, Pastor, I need prayer. I feel like in my life I've been under such assault. The devil's been blurring my lines. And I feel like that's happening. God bless you. Hands are going up. Pray for me. Numbers and numbers of hands. Thank God. I, I, you know, just let the Holy Spirit speak to you as he begins to play. Just let him speak to you. That music you're listening to, that's blurring the line. That... that that communication is blurring the line. That, that entertainment is blurring the line. Here's my challenge. Oh, I'm not interested in what it is. That's between you and God. There's no priest in this church. But you want to bring that to the Lord tonight. The altar's open. Start coming. Start coming. Come even now. Maybe you're here this evening and you just don't know where you're going to spend eternity. Jesus loves you. He died on the cross to save you. 
maybe right now God is speaking to your heart. You want to be saved. Preacher, would you pray for me? I just don't know that I'm saved. Here's my hand. Would you raise it up? Let me pray for you. Anyone like that? Anyone like that? Maybe you say, Pastor, I've got a heavy load in my heart. It's crushing me, and I need God's personal care. Pray for me. Here's my hand. Here's my hand. God bless you. God bless you. Father, bless these hands that were raised. Minister grace to them, I pray. Help us to obey the Spirit, mind the Spirit, and help us to be identified as Christians in this pagan day that we live in. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.